I love food. I really love food. I didn't know how much I love food until a few years ago. These are the people responsible for my loving food so much. Growing up the oldest of six kids, we grew most of the food that we ate. Living in rural Louisiana, on the outskirts of a small town, which consisted of three traffic lights, a few retail stores, three schools, a hospital, two banks and a courthouse, there was room to grow, literally and figuratively. We grew up on land owned by our father's family. There was only a pasture separating a triangulation of homes. Our house, our father's parents, and one set of great-grandparents. Our parents bought staples like rice, flour, sugar, butter, and milk. We ate lots of vegetables, we ate lots of rice, and we ate lots of biscuits. Biscuits baked in a cast iron skillet and usually dripping in butter. I used to joke sometimes that we were weekday vegetarians and didn't know it because we mainly had meat on Sundays and meat on any other day of the week was usually used for seasoning like smoked neck bones and ham hocks and pigtails and hog maws, parts that people don't usually eat every day. Our mother was always cooking something. We had a bunch of food, but we rarely ate out. With the exception of steak sandwiches every once in a while, when they were on sale for 99 cents, or when we went to the city to shop, and we'd stop for hamburgers. Hamburgers were 19 cents. Yes, 19 cents. That was not that long ago, because I am not that old. <laughs> Our father grew up an only child. But he was surrounded by 16 uncles and aunts, many of them close to his own age. And our mother was the oldest of 11. There's a certain work ethic expected in our family. And a lot of that work involved growing our own food. At the height of our food production, there were six gardens, two of them close to the house, and four of them farther away. This was fully necessary if our parents expected to feed six growing kids, feed neighborhood kids, share with relatives, buy a house, invest in land, and support our extracurricular activities. Money was kind of tight because they did all of this on less than $40,000 per year with both parents working and a lot of overtime. But money was for assets and food came from labor. Now, to grow a good garden, you need three things. Good soil, people willing and able to work, and enough water to make a difference. We had good soil. We added fertilizers whenever we needed it. So that leaves people and water. Now picture four of the older kids, preschoolers to teenagers, on the back of a 68 white Dodge pickup, sometimes referred to as the white ghost, because of how our father handled the curves when he drove this truck. And there are five gallon buckets of water scattered among us. That was the water source. There were no seat belts. There were no car seats. 
That was not a requirement back then. If we were successful and we always had plenty of food to put in the freezer, we had purple hull peas, crowders, butter beans, okra, tomatoes, sweet corn, sweet potatoes, collard greens, mustard greens, turnip greens, we had a lot of greens, <laughs> and turnip bottoms. Put that with some cornbread and you had some good eating. We had fruit trees on the east side of the house. And we sometimes picked fruit from neighbors and family friends. Peaches, plums, pears. I can remember the sticky sweet peach juice running down our arms as we gave in to the temptation of eating one more peach directly from the tree instead of putting it in the basket like we were supposed to do. We knew that good food mattered and that it tasted delicious. But doesn't everybody know that good food matters? If everybody knows that good food matters, then why do we have food insecurity? Food insecurity can be defined a couple of ways. One way to define food insecurity is that we don't have enough good food to live an active and healthy lifestyle. Another way to define food insecurity is that we don't have enough good food consistently. To live an active and healthy lifestyle, we need more than just calories. We need good food consistently. Did you know that one in five kids is food insecure. For households headed by single fathers and mothers, for households headed by adults of color, for households living in poverty, food insecurity can be as high as 35%. And good food is an even bigger issue. The lack of good food is highly correlated to diet-related diseases, like heart disease, diabetes, and hypertension. In kids, the lack of good food can lead to poor academic performance and behavioral issues. One in five kids is food insecure. From Miss Rosie, the egg lady, who never had refrigeration, for the dozens of eggs that she sold directly from her car to the sugar cane and watermelon man in our community, we knew where our food came from. And sometimes we got a chance to visit the cussin fish lady with our grandmother. Never knew this woman's name, but two things always came from a visit to her place. Skinned, scaled, and gutted fish ready to cook, and words that we had never heard before. <laughs> Sometimes as compound expletives. Our parents believed that good food mattered, and our mother depended on the nutrition of that good food to ensure that we had a better than fighting chance to excel in school because education mattered. As kids, we ate well. But as we age, this story is changing. Did you know that the fastest growing group of food insecure people is called pre-seniors? Pre-seniors are not quite senior citizens, but approaching that age. They are 50 to 64 years old. That's my peer group. According to a 2014 study, baby boomers and beyond facing hunger after 50, released by Feeding America, 
and supported by the American Association of Retired Persons. 10.4 million senior households face food insecurity. 10.4 million, and by 2025, that number is expected to increase to 15 million. And it's not just about money. The study showed that even if seniors had the money to purchase the food, they could still be food insecure because they couldn't access or prepare the food. And this could have been due to a lack of transportation, mobility issues, functional limitations, or health problems. So we have people that don't have enough food, but we also have food waste. Yeah, we have food waste. 40% of all the food that we produce goes to waste from production to consumption. We waste food because we don't harvest it all from the fields when it's produced. We waste food when we don't sell or purchase all of it from the market. We waste food when we bring it home and we don't consume all of it. We waste food when we eat out and we waste food at events and celebrations. All of this food in this town, that is hundreds of tons of food. 15% of all of the county landfill waste each year right here is food. Now, we don't have to live with food insecurity and food waste. These are things that we can address. We have tools for this. We have the resources to ensure that each of us uh, and our kids, our neighbors, and our el elders have access to good food every day. So what are we going to do about it? Well, one solution that we're working on is called a food hub. A food hub, as defined by the United States Department of Agriculture, is a centrally located facility with a business management structure, infrastructure, that facilitates the aggregation, storage, processing, distribution, and or marketing of locally and regionally produced food products. In our food hub, we are demonstrating the interdependence of eating good food. There is something for everyone. The programs in the Food Hub are based on successful models in other cities. The Food Hub serves as a food distribution point, a food processing and production space, and it houses a kid's kitchen where kids and families can practice hands-on nutrition education and practice their STEM skills, science, technology, engineering, and math all while using local food. So step into the food hub and you will see Brandon, who struggled to finish all the credits for high school, but has a keen interest in culinary arts. So he's participating in our workforce training program and he's making value-added products out of food waste and local excess produce, produce creating jobs and employing more people from the program in the neighborhood. You will see Roche building her bakery business while employing Dan, a culinary graduate who's a dad and found it difficult to earn a living wage in his previous job. As you work your way upstairs to the main floor, Experience China, delivering amazing customer service to Danielle, who participates in our CSA program, and her daughter, Noelle, a four-year-old, who loves pink and purple produce. Share a cup of locally roasted coffee with Sam and Maggie, a senior couple living on a fixed income who sometimes has to choose between bills, 
medicine, and good food. Work your way through the business incubator to the kids' kitchen. Witness Victoria gaining confidence and working on her STEM skills as she creates, designs, and prints edible 3D products. On your last stop, make your way up to the rooftop garden where you will join a class on growing and cooking with herbs with Chef Betty. Connecting with neighbors who also love good food, but because of where they chose to live, before now, they had to leave their neighborhood to get access to healthy, affordable, good food. Good food matters. We are all in this together. It takes people to make systems work, especially food systems. We could have unlimited resources, but if we don't have the right people with the right mindset to meet each of us where we are, it won't work. We have to believe that good food matters because it's the people and the relationships that make ideas possible. We have to want good food and we have to do the work. I believe that we can do this because when we eat well together, we prosper together. We have the resources to ensure that each and every one of us has access to good, healthy, affordable food every day. But we have to pull together the collective will to make that happen. And I believe that we will because everybody knows that good food matters. Thank you.